I uh, did my PhD at the University of Manchester, just graduated a couple years ago. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit about kind of what life has been like after or since my PhD. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I've, I'm from Colorado originally in the States. You might hear the very strong American accent. Um, I did a bachelor's of science in meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. Um, then I went off to East Carolina University and got my master's in geography. Uh, my master's thesis was about the communication of weather information and how we can get uh, first responders and emergency responders to use uh, weather information more efficiently. Um, one of the outcomes of that project was to get onset of tropical storm force wind forecasts, which helped the emergency responders um, respond in hurricanes, so that was pretty fun. Then I moved across the Atlantic. Um, I have this kind of tendency to move further and further east. I moved to the east coast. My mom said, you're not going to move further east than that, and I proved her wrong, unfortunately. Um, so I came over to Manchester. I did my PhD um, studying tornadoes in the UK. Since then, um, I went off to Reading. I did a year and a half postdoc, again studying the communication of uncertainty. After that postdoc ended, I moved into the private sector. I am now a catastrophe modeler, which in my opinion is the world's sexiest job title. Has anyone ever heard of catastrophe modeling? Couple, couple of nods. I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. Um, and kind of along the way, I did a couple of other things. I worked at the National Severe Storms Laboratory as a research assistant, as well as the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So I've kind of done a couple of things in academia, a couple of things in the research land, and, and now I'm working in the private sector. So I'm going to talk about a couple of those things. So transitioning from my PhD to the real world, my number one point is that it's OK everything is fine. If you guys have the personality to do a PhD, if you have the drive and motivation to finish a PhD, you're going to be absolutely fine in the real world. From my experience, first of all, the real world pays better than a PhD, so that's something really nice to look forward to. Um, and things just settle down a lot more um, from that. And if you run into trouble during your PhD, you go to calminghumanity.com and just keep on pressing refresh and you'll get beautiful pictures like this one. So I've noticed a couple of things uh, that kind of are contrasts between working in academia versus working in the private sector. So first of all, you may or may not have noticed that working in academia, you have really flexible, or you tend to have really flexible working hours. You can show up really early, or you could show up really late. You could work in the middle of the night. You can work weekends. And typically, if that's OK, as long as you get your job done. Um, in the private sector, it's a bit more strict. Yes, you can work from home a bit. Yes, you can have a bit more flexible hours. But typically, I have to be in quite early. But as soon as about half five rolls around, the office empties out and you can go home. In the research world, you have a bit more flexibility to go down rabbit holes. If you see a really interesting paper that's kind of tangentially relevant to what you're doing, you're pretty much free to go down that rabbit hole for a couple months and see where it goes. That's not quite the case in the private sector. The rabbit hole is fine as long as it helps the bottom line. Um, which is, is good and a bad thing, depending on your personality. Um, one thing I found in research land, in academia land, is that it's kind of a series of short contracts. So um, for me personally, I had a year and a half long contract at the University of Reading. After that, it was really hard to find more funding to keep on going. Because I am a foreigner and an immigrant, um, I really had to have a job to stay in this country. So that kind of instability for me just didn't quite work. For a lot of people, it works just fine. A lot of people get three-year contracts and, and just keep on rolling with that. So something to keep in mind versus the private sector, there are a whole load of permanent roles. So again, it's kind of what suits you well. Um, in the research world, you get to kind of chase up your own work. You get to find your own work, find your own projects, find what interests you, find what is interesting and applicable to the world. Versus when you work in the private sector, you have a never-ending supply of work to do, but it may not necessarily be the work you're particularly interested in. 
So again, that's kind of up to personal choice. If you are really good at chasing up that little niche that needs researching, academia is a really good place for you. If you want a constant supply of jobs to do, <laughs> the private sector is pretty good. One thing I struggled with in academia was I struggled with this question of will other people see my work? And I spent a lot of time, time, a lot of time trying to publicize my work, trying to get people to read it. So like I said, in, in my postdoc, I was researching the communication of uncertainty. Can expert and public users understand uncertainty in climate, in gas and oil prices, and all of these things? And I thought it was really, really relevant to kind of the wider world. But I was finding it was really hard to get that message out to the wider world, which I, I quite struggled with. Versus in the private sector, there's no money if people aren't going to use your work, to be blunt. So actually, your work is definitely going to be out there and definitely going to be used. A lot of people complain about bureaucracy. In research world and academia world, you're not going to get away from that in the private sector. thought I would point that out. You do have to have like seven layers of approval for expenses and all that stuff. So unfortunately, no matter what you do, you're stuck with that. So I have a couple of top tips for getting a job, especially in the private sector. The first one is really highlight what's different about you. So I was actually looking at CVs just yesterday for a job that we have open at our company. A lot of them have a lot of the same things. They're all PhDs. They all have modeling experience. They all have been teaching assistants. Um, it's those slightly different things that really set them apart. So. My example, my boss told me that um, she really liked that I study communication and I've done a little bit of research into communication. That was the little tiny difference that made my CV stand out. So if you guys have that one little thing, that one little difference, that little bit of experience that slightly sets you apart, definitely highlight that on your CV, which will help. Especially in the private sector, research the company you're about to work for. I know that sounds really pedantic and like, oh yeah, of course you should do. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't really, really research what the company did when I went to the interview. I didn't really have an idea to get the job in the end, but it really would have helped me if I actually did my backup research and look at that first. Um, if you do any form of programming whatsoever, highlight that as high up as you possibly can on your CV. Nearly every job in the private sector, even if it's not super technical, is starting to need these programming skills. So if you can highlight that on your CV, I guarantee you it will help. And the last point is don't be discouraged if you don't have experience in a particular field. So I'll give you an example. So our company, which I'll talk about in just a second, we model cyber terrorism risk. I do not have any experience in cyber attacks other than trying to you know, update my virus protection on my computer. Um, but they're hiring atmospheric scientists to go and research cyber risk. And it doesn't have a whole lot to do with, do you know cyber risk? It's a very, very niche subject. It's more to do with your analytical skills and if you can kind of start noticing patterns and all this sort of thing with, with cyber risk. So don't be afraid of jobs that you think, actually, I'm not really an expert in these kinds of things, because quite often they're looking for someone with analytical skills who can use those skills towards, um, towards these sorts of jobs. Right, I'd get in trouble from my boss if I didn't talk a little bit about what I do and what my company does. So I work for a company called Risk Management Solutions. Um, we are the world's leading provider of catastrophe risk models and scientific information related to the financial impact of natural catastrophes. Um, most of our clients are insurers and reinsurers. Reinsurers are the people who insure insurance companies. Blows my mind every single time. Um, our aim is to help the financial insurance companies to make informed decisions about their risk management. So one of the things we do is we help quantify and price risk. And a lot of this comes actually from the 90s when Hurricane Andrew struck Florida. So when Hurricane Andrew struck, loads of people filed insurance claims. And the insurance companies actually didn't have enough money in the bank to pay those out. And you can imagine there were some people who were none too pleased about that situation. They've been paying their premiums for years and years, and they can't actually get the payout on their house. So there's been worldwide legislation in place actually now that Insurance companies have to prove they have enough money in the bank 
to pay out if the big one occurs. So how do they know how much the big one will cost? So that's what we model. We provide these um, both physically based and probabilistically based models on all sorts of hazards worldwide. And we help answer these kinds of questions. So should I insure this company? And if so, and if so, how much should I charge? How much risk should I retain versus reinsure? How much risk can I write? How can I diversify my business? So things like if you're insuring a house against an earthquake in California and all of your insurance uh, uh, portfolio is in California against earthquake, if that one earthquake happens, you're bust, right? So it's better to diversify and that's kind of some of the stuff that we, uh, we provide answers to. So catastrophe modeling in particular looks at four things. So we look at the peril. So we'll look at, for example, all of the realistic tracks a hurricane could take in the Atlantic Basin. Then you look at the hazard within that peril. So for example, the wind and the storm surge within that hurricane. Then you have to look at the vulnerability. So taking that hazard, applying it to houses, the houses are gonna react differently in, for example, Florida versus New England because of building codes, because of all of that kind of thing. And then you have to translate all of that information to get a dollar loss output for all of that. Pretty tricky. Takes a lot of research and a lot of playing with it, but I can guarantee you it's very fun. So what we do is we have over 200 peril models covering more than 100 countries. We model things like hurricanes, typhoons, earthquakes, cyber, terrorism. Uh, we do marine cargo, we do floods, we do basically any peril you can imagine that you can insure against. Now what I particularly do is this little small group and we're called event response. So we do catastrophe modeling, but we don't do it for the big what if cases. We do catastrophe modeling for when the event happens. So we provide the real time information shortly before or just after um, a storm happens. So it helps clients to see, oh dear, Hurricane Irma has formed in the Atlantic. How much of my portfolio could potentially be at risk for this? And we also make loss estimates as quickly and efficiently as possible. And we're a service that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, here's a list of some of the big modeling projects we've done in the last year, or last couple of years, rather. A lot of hurricanes, so there's a lot of insurance uh, penetration for the east coast of the US and the Gulf Coast as well. We've also done severe tropical cyclone Debbie, which hit um, Australia last year. So this is kind of our wind footprint, our hazard footprint for uh, cyclone Debbie. Uh, here's our flood footprint for Harvey. So Harvey made landfall in Texas at the end of August, beginning of September last year, and just stalled for days and days and days, causing horrific flooding in um, in the Houston area, so we have a flood model in the U.S., so we uh, got to model the flooding for Harvey. And again, we got to do the wind, uh, wind footprints and storm surge footprints for Hurricane uh, Irma and Jose and Maria as well. It was a busy summer. So here's, here's some of our footprints, some of our products that we did for the hurricane season last year. Um, our old CEO was on TV, that's my boss, my other boss, who was on TV on the BBC. He was on two BBC programs in one day. Um, so we have put out these uh, loss estimates as well, which help the insurance industry. So if we have a quick loss estimate of we think the total, total insured losses are about $25 billion, the insurance industry will know, well, I think I have about 10% of the insurance penetration in that area, and they have a really quick idea of how much money they may have lost, and they can be sure that they have that money in the bank and they can prepare for future events for later in the year. So anyone who's graduating soonish, we do have um, careers at RMS. There are a couple of positions open. Um, I've mentioned cyber for a very specific reason because we have a cyber analyst position open right now. The team is really interesting and really fun. Uh, we have an agriculture modeling position open as well. So 
drought, especially in Asia, that's a huge, huge market. Um, and we also have a job in event response, what I do, open right now, so anyone who is graduating soon, definitely have a look at our careers page. We also have internships, summer internships, so all sorts of things. Um, if you want to find out more about RMS, find out more about my little journey since my PhD, feel free to contact me. My contact information is in the bottom left corner. Um, I wanted to end as soon as possible so we could get to questions, so I'm happy to take any questions you guys might have.